Shamina was on her way home from school when the first ships appeared in the sky. She had taken extra classes in metallurgy and chemistry on sixth days, and the season was winding down, so the purple twilight was already beginning to fade. The big orange flowers on the spike flower hedge were already closing up, like old-fashioned, warm, incandescent bulbs going out one by one. Far beyond the hedge, the massive backs of the Grumbers floated majestically by. The smart animals were returning to their nightly stalls. Absorbed in her thoughts, she didn't immediately notice what was happening. However, after only a few minutes, another ship, a massive dark steel cloud, hung almost over her head, and it was no longer possible to ignore the obvious. Tamilstone wasn't exactly a galactic backwater, and it wasn't the first time Shamina, who lived in the countryside, had seen an interstellar ship. The planet was frequented by traders, recruiters of colonization corporations, and even tourists. Tamilstone was a beautiful world, and many cruises included a visit to the dancing sands of the ultimate desert, or the giant oceanic vortex of the dragon's throat. Still, the ships usually arrived at one of the planet's five major spaceports, and they certainly didn't arrive in such large numbers. Shamina stopped, and for a while, looked in surprise at the nearest ship, which was slowly descending over the neighboring pasture, growing larger and larger, so that it suddenly occurred to her that the ship was even bigger than it had seemed to her at first, significantly larger. The ship's appearance was unfamiliar to her, but that didn't surprise her. She hadn't been to Calpent, the nearest city with a spaceport, for a few years, and she wasn't too interested in interstellar technology in general. Not like her older brother Shai Milt, who was planning to go to the Flight Academy on Komsafon II, a planet in a neighboring star system, after graduating from the local college. Still, something was nagging her. Perhaps it was the fact that the ship was so large, or maybe it was that when she looked around, she saw that it wasn't alone. There were dozens of ships. Hundreds. What were they doing here in the quiet, peaceful farming province of Tamilstone? And why were they landing literally in the middle of nowhere, in an ordinary pasture? If such a thing descends on a field, the pasture will be destroyed, regardless of any gravitational compensators. This particular pasture was not communal. It belonged to the Das Stopley family with whom the Chimina family maintained friendly relations. Of course, it wasn't their only pasture, but no one wanted to lose a field like this in the middle of summer, when the Grumbers were gaining weight and preparing for the fall split. But what can she do? Such a huge ship can't be stopped by waving her arms. She simply won't be noticed. And if she is seen, it's not certain that she'll be considered. Chimina thought for a while looking at the sky dotted with alien ships, then pulled out her comm, quickly took a few pictures, and ran towards the house. Everyone had probably already noticed what was happening, so there was no point in racking her brain alone. She would tell her parents and the community, incidents like this should be thought through by as many people as possible. Of course, everyone at home was already aware of it, the family gathered in the living room around a large stereo screen that displayed the drone's picture. Shy Milt must have launched one of his homemade crafts, which he designed and assembled as a hobby from parts ordered from Calpent. The drone rose about 200 meters, and from that height, it was obvious that there were a lot of ships. They did not descend directly into the pastures and fields, but hovered above the ground, looking like ugly metal fruits of some unseen technological tree that had broken off from a branch but had not reached the ground for some reason. The elders have already contacted the other communities and Calpent, Father said. He stood beside the screen. His sturdily built tall figure was calm and confident, as was his face, with its slightly sharp features and brown eyes framed by a neatly trimmed beard that was beginning to show gray. Ships seemed to be popping up all over the planet. No one had done an exact count, 
but the best estimates were in the tens of thousands. Tens of thousands, Shamina and Shy Milt exclaimed. Father nodded. That's exactly right. Perhaps even more than that. Kelpent and the other cities are still figuring out how this armada slipped past the outer customs orbitals and planetary observation posts unnoticed. But that's not important right now. This is important. We don't know who it is or what they want. This is a patrol matter, Shymilt exclaimed. After all, why do we pay taxes to the Federation of Free Worlds? So they can protect us, right? That's right, said Uncle Snotal, his father's older brother. He lived in a small house he'd built on the outskirts of the family lands after his wife had died two years ago of blue shaking. Except that the nearest patrol base is three light years away, with several destroyers and one cruiser assigned to it. What can they do with that many ships? Then we must gather a militia, Shay Milt exclaimed. We'll defend ourselves. Father smiled. Defend ourselves from what? He asked. And you ask? Shymil jumped up, pointing at the screen. He was out of breath with indignation. You can't see well? Then you can look out the window. It'll be just as fine. Father raised his hand in a calming gesture. I can see everything. But have we been attacked? So far, these ships have not been aggressive towards us. They haven't even messed up the fields and pastures. Tamilstone is an open world. Even registering for customs orbitals is considered voluntary. Whoever they are, they haven't broken our laws yet. Shy Milt froze in place with his mouth hanging open. But Merrick, you have to admit that it's a little unusual and frightening, said Mom, who had been silent until now. She was sitting in the chair across from Shamina, and the girl could tell that Tana Aswell looked neither confused nor frightened. They came down on our heads like snow in the middle of a hot summer, seemingly out of nowhere, without a warning or greeting. Why such a mystery? What do they want? Merrick Aswell looked around at his household and spread his hands. I can't answer that yet, but I think we'll find out soon enough. And the best tactic for now, I think, is not to draw any unwarranted conclusions or take any hasty action. He looked at Shy Milt carefully. He tried to answer his father with a defiant look, but quickly became embarrassed and stared sullenly at the stereo screen. The armada was still silent and indifferent, gleaming cold metal in the setting sun. Besides, given their numbers, there's not much we can do anyway. Tamilstone is a peaceful planet. We're used to negotiating, not fighting. And that is our greatest strength. Shy Milt, who was still in the mood to argue, wanted to object but could not find anything to say, and only when everyone had gone to their rooms after dinner did he grumble sullenly. I hope it will turn out to be a strength, or else. He didn't elaborate, but Chimina understood his mood perfectly tens of thousands of ships. If the aliens were up to no good, Tamilstone wouldn't stand a chance. Even if the local hotheads or the patrol put up a vigorous resistance, what would the planet be like with fighting in every corner of it? That thought kept her awake for a long time, but eventually, fatigue took its toll. Of course, everyone rushed to the windows first thing in the morning, but there had been no change overnight. The ship still hung silently and idly in the air all over Tamilstone. The news channels of the World Hypernet showed news reports as if they had been copied. Only the scenery under the ships changed, not responding to any requests by all possible means of communication. Tamilstone had no military forces, and the heads of police departments from different cities decided to do nothing until the patrol arrived on the planet. The request to the patrol's base three light years away from Tamilstone, had already been sent, and the arrival of the Rapid Response Fleet detachment was expected within seven or eight days. The main question bothered everybody. What would have happened if the mysterious aliens had been the first to take active steps, and if, God forbid, those steps had turned out to be aggressive? 
Some people hurried to get off the planet with the first ship they could find. But in general, fleeing was not in the character of the Tamil stoners. And there was no panic in the spaceports. The Aswell family listened to all this news over breakfast in almost complete silence. Everyone wanted to know as much as possible about what was happening. But the news didn't clarify anything. The big questions, who are they and what do they want, remained unanswered. After breakfast, Shymilt tried to have another discussion about the need to start preparing for resistance. Still, his father categorically stated that he didn't want to hear anything about it. If Shymilt wished to use his energy for the benefit of society, he could finish repairing the skimmer for Sheriff Twise and take the vehicle back to the owner. It would give him a chance to talk about the day's problems with someone who had a duty to think about them if the sheriff had time to talk nonsense. Shymilt frowned, but he had no arguments left. In the meantime, Taina contacted the school administration and they told her there was no question of canceling classes, but that they were willing to accommodate those parents and students who were concerned about the situation and allow them to participate in classes remotely via the hypernet. Taina looked at her daughter, and Shamina shook her head desperately. She didn't want to stay at home right now. After all, she was almost an adult in her senior year. All this discussion took about ten minutes at most. Shamina had already picked up her school bag and grabbed the doorknob when Shy Milt's loud shout came from the living room. Look! Look! I told you! But Shamina didn't even turn around. She already saw everything herself through the thick glass of the front door. From all the ships, and there were at least half a dozen of them visible from the doorstep of the Aswell's house, like a swarm of angry bees or wasps, a lot of small flying devices burst out and flew down and away, heading each to its own goal. One of them grew larger until Shimina realized it was heading precisely for their homestead. By the time the patrol's rapid response unit finally arrived in the Tamilstone system, it was all but over. On the one hand, Patrol Command expressed a certain amount of displeasure that they had been yanked to Tamilstone for next to nothing. On the other hand, the patrolmen, especially the rank and file, who, of course, took the opportunity to use their leave and take a break from statutory fleet life on the spacious plains and colorful mountains of Tamilstone, made no secret that they were quite satisfied with the fact that there was no need to get involved in a hopeless battle with 18,000 Stoblar migrant ships. And it was 18,000 ships that had come to Tamilstone. And they all needed one thing, a stopover. It just so happened that Chimina's family was one of the first to sign a contract with a Stoblar ship. When the skimmer from the Stoblar Ark landed on the porch of the Aswell's house and four Stoblar representatives got out of it, it was decided at a quick impromptu family council that it was not appropriate to shoot the guests at sight, especially since they did not show any particular aggression, but just stood quietly near their vehicle and waited for someone to come out of the house. Shai Milt suggested that someone should go with the rifle into the attic and hold the aliens at gunpoint while they negotiated, but Uncle Snoddle, who was also having breakfast with the family, told Shai Milt not to fool around. As far as I can estimate, tens of thousands of them are on this ship, he said, pointing to the nearest ship from which the guests had come. What would they do if we started shooting at their tribesmen out of the blue? If they wanted to hurt us, there was no way we could stop them. Shimina was struck by how much the Stoblers looked like humans, though it was immediately obvious that they were not. A different facial structure, though with the same features, nose, two eyes, mouth, ears. The eyes were larger and more widely spaced, the nose more pointed, the lips thinner, the ears larger, but pressed against a bare, hairless skull. The figures of the Stoblars, undoubtedly humanoid, nevertheless also looked alien and attractive simultaneously. Everything was slightly different, the proportions, the length of the limbs, even the number of fingers. 
The Stoblars had six. And yet they looked graceful and natural at the same time. Of course, at this point, no one was calling them Stoblars yet. Nothing was surprising in the fact that some races were completely unknown to the inhabitants of Tamilstone. There were thousands of different kinds of intelligent beings in the galaxy, and it was simply impossible, and not necessary, to know about all of them. True, no one had ever appeared on Tamilstone in such a dramatic way. We are Stoblers, said one of the four aliens. His bluish-gray skin was slightly darker than that of his three companions. For some reason, Shamina decided it was a sign of age. We're looking for a place to stop for a while. We don't want conflict. We are offering a contract and payment. He spoke interlingua very correctly, the way those who have learned the language with a neural shunt usually do, having never spoken to a native speaker. However, his voice had such a pleasant tone and was so melodic that it offset the usual talking robot feeling common in such cases. Shamina noticed her father exchanging quick glances with her mother and Uncle Snotal. She had seen such family telepathy on rare occasions when an important decision had to be made without wasting time talking, and she knew immediately what the adults had decided. All right, father said, stepping from the porch toward the strangers. Shymilt jerked to follow, but Uncle Snowtall took him firmly by the shoulder and held him in place. What exactly are you interested in? What do you mean by needing a place? Where? How much? For how long? The older Stoblar retrieved a small folder from behind his back and held it to Marek. This is our standard contract, he said. We don't cheat. We pay in osmium, iridium, or any other equivalent. We are not dangerous. Father took the folder and opened it carefully. These days, to get around the Stobler plantation, Shamina had to make a 15-minute detour on her way to and from school, but she wasn't too worried about it. Why not walk a bit when the weather was fine and life was going well? The Stobler payment guaranteed her admission to the best university within a 30-light-year radius, the Solar Academy in the Po Terrain system. She'd never dreamed of such a thing before and she was going to get a degree at her home university of Calpent, work as an engineer for a couple years on in-system orbitals, and then, once she'd gained experience and saved up some money, go somewhere else. The Aswells were a well-to-do family by Tamilstone standards, but the cost of studying in the best institutions in the local sector of the galaxy was beyond their means, and it was all thanks to the mysterious strangers. No one had ever discovered where these Stoblars had come from or why they had chosen Tamilstone as a stopover. Even the patrol commanders had come out almost empty-handed. In their database, there was only a mention that the Stoblars were a civilization of nomadic galactic type, the origin of which was not known. That was all. Theoretically, the patrol could pull up the reserves and attack the Armada. Theoretically the patrol could pull up the reserves and attack the armada, but the only guaranteed result of such a decision would be to turn Tamilstone into a dead ash heap, and the Stoblers had not given the slightest reason to suspect them of aggressive intentions. The planet found itself in a strange situation. Its population had suddenly increased by several tens, if not hundreds of millions of intelligent beings about whom the native inhabitants knew nothing. Actually, no one knew the exact or even approximate number of Stoblars. All estimates were speculatively derived from the number and size of ships and assumptions about how many Stoblars could live in each. They invited no one to their ships, and those who tried to enter were politely but adamantly turned back. There was no way to expel the Stoblars, or any reason to do so. They left their ships only in relatively small groups of no more than a few hundred, mostly to work the fields they had leased. 
These fields seem to be the main reason they chose to stop on their endless, incomprehensible journey. The Stoblars had rented the land from the locals for six months, paying so generously in advance that almost none of the Tamil stoners had the guts to refuse, though the local farmers were far from poor. They planted plants on their allotted plots, which immediately started to grow, and, by the end of the fifth month, were already reaching the size of the local pines, though their leafless twisted branches covered with thick lilac fluff looked more like the tentacles of sea mollusks than normal tree limbs. There were the most incredible rumors about these plantation groves, as it always goes, but the truth was that no one really knew anything. The Stoblers covered each plantation with a force field that no one could penetrate but themselves. In response to questions and even timid protests, they said that it was done solely for the reasons of safety, but they did not say whether it was for the safety of the plants or those who wanted to get close to them. But the work they were doing in the plantings was unobstructed, and it was this work, more than anything else, that reassured the prudent Tamilstone farmers. The Stoblers watered their trees, removed diseased shoots, and sprayed the trunks with some kind of preparations. They generally engaged in perfectly understandable and familiar ways for many generations of Tamilstone farmers' village work. The planet's inhabitants might not be too interested in galactic problems, but those who cultivated the land planted something in it and grew crops were close and understandable to them, no matter how unusual they looked. Shamina walked past a small group of Stoblars loading equipment into a large skimmer. They worked silently and only said a distinct and almost synchronized hello in response to her cheerful greeting. The Stoblars' reticence at first surprised and even annoyed many of the Tamilstoners, but gradually they got used to it, especially when they noticed that the Stoblars never spoke to each other either, which meant that it was just a peculiarity of theirs and not a sign of impolitness to those on whose lands they had temporarily settled. Uncle Snotel, who had connections in the patrol, had once told that scientists suspected that the Stoblars communicated with each other in some other way than by sound, but that they had not yet been able to detect it, neither in the ultrasonic range nor on radio waves. The radical zealous heads from the patrol's intelligence department even thought of kidnapping one Stoblar to properly investigate. But sanity prevailed, and this idea was abandoned. With nearly 20,000 ships hovering over your planet and a total population that may be comparable to the entire planet, taking the risk of mortally offending or angering them is not a good idea. The time for payback is approaching. Soon, we will make up the debt, and the journey will continue. Chimina almost stumbled, turning around at the sudden melodious voice behind her. One of the Stoblars stood a few paces away from her. Judging by his almost gray skin, it was a Stoblar of a very advanced age. The others crowded around the skimmer and looked in their direction. Stoblars almost never initiated conversations with people except for the first wave of introductions, with offers to contract out land leases. Now, it was so sudden that Shamina glared at the strangers in surprise, completely unsure of what to say. The elderly Stobler stared at her unblinkingly, but Chimina had the impression that he hardly noticed her. It was as if he were looking very far away beyond the horizon, into the vast space through which the Stoblers made their endless way. Are you leaving? Shamina finally squeezed out, involuntarily looking at the huge silhouette of the ship, which occupied a quarter of the evening sky. It was impossible to tell anything from the opaque violet eyes without pupils, but somehow Shamina felt that Stoblar's gaze was focused on her again. The journey must continue the Stoblar said. The installments will be paid and the results summarized, and the journey will continue. Stay alert. He turned and walked toward the skimmer, where the other Stoblars awaited him. 
As she recounted this strange conversation over dinner, Shamina was angry at herself for not being able to convey to her loved ones the sense of something incredibly important and, at the same time, infinitely sad that she had sensed in the words and behavior of the old Stoblar. Only Shy Milt, who had hitherto taken every opportunity to speak ill of the Stolbars, threw it carelessly. Which old man is that? The one who used to drop in on us at the beginning? I don't know. Those blue weirdos all look the same to me. The aliens didn't use names, which initially created much confusion when signing rental contracts. They seemed to understand what a personal name was, but they didn't use them themselves, like a blind man knows from hearsay about the existence of colors, but is unable to understand what they are. However, Shamina gradually began to notice that there were some individual differences between the strangers, and she thought that the old Stoblar, who addressed her with an unexpected speech, she saw on the field of the aliens more often than others, but she was not a hundred percent sure of it. But how can she explain all this to her father, mother, and Uncle Snowdle? She was awakened by a loud knock on the door followed by excited shouts. When Shamina opened her eyes, she found the whole room flooded with a strange, reddish light streaming through the window. She glanced at the watches, two o'clock in the morning, so it must still be quite dark, but... Chema, get up, came Shymilt's voice. It's starting. Damn, it's finally started. I told we should have formed a militia. Shamina jumped out of bed. All the adults were already in the living room, fully dressed. Moreover, Uncle Snotel had an assault rifle hanging on his shoulder, and her father and Shy Milt had pulse guns in their hands. What? What's wrong? Chimina stared incomprehensibly at the grave, tense faces of her family members. It started. Shy Milt couldn't hold back a triumphant grin, though he was visibly frightened, among other things. Invasion! Invasion! Kamina looked at her father in horror, but he only shook his head. We don't know for sure, but... They're disembarking from ships, it looks like all of them. The sheriff raised the alarm half an hour ago, see for yourself. He stepped to the side, and Shamina stared at the stereo screen, flooded with the same purple glow that shone through all the windows. Apparently, surveillance cameras had been set up on some sort of towers a short distance from the Stoblar landing. The ship, which had hovered about half a kilometer above the fields before, had now dropped almost to the ground, down to about 20 meters. Several wide rectangular hatches opened in the ship's sides, from which equally wide sloping ramps ran downward. The source of the light was somewhere there, but Chimina could not identify it. The ship, the grove below it, and the ramps with hatches were glowing, but that was not the main thing. Vast streams of stoblars were flowing down the ramps, onto the ground, and to the grove. There were even more of them on the ship than the boldest estimates had suggested. Shamina even wondered for a moment. Where would they all fit? A whole sea of stoblars had already frozen around the grove. Unlike people, who in such a cluster would certainly jostle, sway, and create brownie in motion and an unsteady hum of voices, the Stoblars stood motionless and silent, like some stone-carved composition of a crazy, monumental sculptor. Fresh Stoblars approached this petrified formation and, row after row, stood motionless in place, facing the grove located precisely in the center. But they're not attacking or moving this way, Shamina said confusedly. They're just standing there. For now, said Uncle Snowdle, for now. But the very fact that they're getting out of the ships, it's happening everywhere, all over the planet. The sheriffs announced a gathering at the mill site, Father said. It's literally next to the nearest Stoblar landing. His idea was not to take women and children. Chimina looked at him pleadingly. 
but I'd feel better if you were with me instead of down here in the basement where I can't see you, he added, smiling slightly, though the atmosphere was not optimistic. There's room for everyone in the cargo skimmer. Dressed in the work overalls she usually wore to work in the garden, Mom stood up from the couch with determination. Let's go, she said. There's nothing to wait for. Talking to the sheriff was not reassuring. What could a few hundred men, of whom only a couple dozen had military experience, do against a crowd of at least a hundred thousand aliens? No amount of weapons will help. Yes, the message to the patrol has already been sent. But what can it do against hundreds of millions of aliens scattered all over Tamilstone? They can't start a nuclear carpet bombardment of the planet. Look, exclaimed one of the crowd, pointing toward the landing and the alien ship. Apparently, the Stoblar ships were subject to the same spatial laws as the rest of the universe after all, and had a capacity limit. The streams of aliens coming down the ramps had dried up. All the Stoblars stood around the grove, and the ship slowly pulled the ramps back in. The ramps disappeared into the hatchways, and then the hatchways closed, and then the ship shuddered and slid smoothly to the side. Is he just going to fly away and leave all this crowd here? Someone asked confusedly. Nobody answered. The ship didn't fly away. Instead, it stopped just above the Stoblar Grove, exactly over the center of the giant crowd. A bright scarlet light struck from its underside, as if to connect the ship to the twisted trunks. What happened next? All the witnesses tried to remember it as rarely as possible, and almost never discussed it. It seemed to many people that all this had not really happened, that they had dreamed it all up like the whole visit to Tamilstone by the Stoblars, so incredible and surreal was the sight. The huge crowd slowly swayed and moved inwards towards the grove. It seemed to Shamina that the front ranks were about to be inevitably pressed against the trunks, crushed, flattened into a pancake, but it didn't happen. The Tamilstoners were not that far from the crowd of aliens, on the top of a small hill. The light streaming from the ship brought the whole picture into focus with unbelievable clarity. The trees in the grove were planted not so closely that it would be impossible to pass between them, which the front rows of Stoblars did. They entered the grove and disappeared into it. They were followed by another row and another and another. It's growing, Shymilt said, stunned. Look, it's growing. It's consuming them. As more and more aliens poured into the grove, its appearance changed. From its center rose a massive formation identical to the other tree's down-covered trunks, but with a girth of many meters. The thick branches that sprang from it stretched upward toward the ship, intertwining and growing into each other, and eventually merging into a massive common trunk. The tree trunks around the perimeter of the grove also grew thicker and thicker until the Stoblars could squeeze between them no longer. Then the aliens simply stopped and waited for the grayish mass to close around them, and the next Stoblars, approaching from all sides, simply leaned against the incredible tree, spreading their arms as if trying to embrace it, and plunged into it. The giant crowd melted and shriveled like water going into a funnel. Only it wasn't water. It was thousands of living sentient beings being swallowed up by the horrible plant in the center. The plant grew and grew, reaching for the ship until it finally closed with its bottom like a giant placenta, connecting the ship to the ground and continuously processing the stoblars that were pouring into it. Shamina thought she could even see some shuddering in the creeping cord, like contractions of smooth muscle in the intestines, but she wasn't sure if she imagined it in the strange reddish light. Meanwhile, the process was accelerating. The remaining Stoblars were no longer cramped up against the living pillar, but ran from all sides, slamming into its surface, which immediately closed up behind them like dough or sour cream. None of the aliens could make a sound. 
When the last alien disappeared into the gray column, a visible shiver ran through it. The ship jerked, too, and began to rise faintly, stretching the umbilical cord still clinging to the soil of Tamilstone. It stretched for a while, but the roots, or whatever it was, slowly began to come out of the ground until they finally popped out all at once. The ship hung still for a few moments, with only the creepy thing swaying underneath it as if shaking the roots off clods of soil, and then it suddenly pulled itself inside the ship, all of it, so that no one could tell if it was a cargo hatch or something else. It was more like a child spoiling itself by sucking in a long spaghetti or flexible candy. The ship froze as if digesting what it had swallowed, and then silently, faster and faster, gained altitude until, at last, all that was left of it was a red dot in the dark night sky, which blinked a couple of times and was lost among the countless stars. The people were silent, unable to comprehend what they had just seen. In this complete silence, the quiet buzzing of the communicator hit everyone's nerves like a gunshot. Some even jumped. The sheriff pressed the call receive button and adjusted the earpiece. After hearing the message, he put the communicator away again, gazed blankly around at the people staring at him, and said, They're gone. All of them. Not a single ship left. Not a single. They're all gone. Then he turned and walked through the misty early morning fields to where the nearest houses of the community loomed dimly. Surprisingly enough, the strange occurrence had left almost no trace in the life of Tamilstone, save for the remarkably improved financial situation of many of its inhabitants, of course. However, those who received payment from the Stoblers preferred not to publicize this fact, as if embarrassed, as if they had touched something vile and shameful. Shymilt flew away with the patrol detachment. Several officers promised to give him recommendations for the flight academy. A couple of months after the aliens disappeared, she still couldn't bring herself to call it a departure. Shamina had graduated from high school with honors and was now preparing to enter her cherished university. Strictly speaking, there was nothing to worry about. She had an excellent grade point average, and the only thing she had worried about before was money. Her father and mother, naturally, were worried. You bet. Both of their children, who of course were already far from being children, but it would never matter to the parents, were leaving home in the same season. However, you can't argue with time and its demands. Of course, Marek and Tana ensured their children would not leave empty-handed. Uncle Snowtall was already properly rooted, and taking a few small saplings was no problem at all. It was not good for the youngsters to leave their homeland without anything to remind them that the time for the installments to be paid was just around the corner. The journey must continue.